one of the most secretive nations on Earth, a place where information is tightly controlled and dissent can disappear without a trace. Yet at great personal risk, these photos were smuggled out. They offer a rare, uncensored glimpse into the reality of North Korea. Three generation rule. Just wait for this. In North Korea, there is an absolutely crazy law where if you commit a crime and the punishment is that you get sent to a prison camp, if you try to escape from that prison camp, your whole family will join you. That's right, up to three generations of prisoners for just one crime from one person. You could spend years behind bars because of a crime your grandparent did 40 years ago. They say make the punishment fit the crime. This is like the absolute opposite of that. Mental. Coming in at number 9 now, we have government approved haircuts. If I was a North Korean, my hair would definitely be illegal. There are state sanctioned haircuts for men and women and if you stray too far away from them, you could get in some serious trouble. Women have 14 styles to choose from depending on their marriage status, while men are prohibited from growing their hair longer than 5 centimeters, roughly 2 inches. This law may have been relaxed in recent years, but I wouldn't take a chance on it. Moving on to number 8 now, bowing down. If you're planning on visiting North Korea, you must bow down to the statue of Kim Jong Un, the country's supreme leader. If you refuse to bow your head, you will be asked again. If you still say no, the police will take you back to your hotel and lock you in your room for the rest of your trip. You will then be banned from visiting North Korea ever again. Poor you. Don't worry though, I'm sure there are plenty of other countries out there that will lock you in your room for not bowing to a statue. Actually, I can't think of a single one. Next up at number seven, you have to vote. One of the things that most democratic and free nations like to take pride in is that everyone has the right to vote. However, if you really don't want to, you don't have to, except in North Korea. On election day, everyone has to head to the ballot box and take part in a sham election. Amazingly, it's been the same party that's won every single time for over 70 years. They must be really great. The handsome man in the elevator comes onto this list at number 6. If you ever find yourself in Korea, never ever let a handsome man in the elevator. Well, there's an urban legend about a Korean girl who lives on the 14th floor in an apartment building. This girl stayed late one night studying in the library, so she didn't make it home until it was almost pitch black outside. She never liked coming home at this hour because she didn't feel safe in her neighborhood. So when she finally made it to her apartment building, she rushed to the elevator and hit the 14th floor. As the doors were about to close, a handsome man came running in and stopped at the doors. He made a joke about her living on the 14th floor because he actually lives on the 13th floor. During their elevator ride together, the handsome man was flirting with the girl and she seemed to be interested in him. However, once they stopped on the 13th floor, he said, I'll see you upstairs, and he pulled out a knife. And then he laughed like a maniac and ran for the stairs. The young girl tried to hit the emergency button, but nothing seemed to work. Once she hit the 14th floor, she knew she was about to die. Some people believe that this crazy man is still on the loose murdering people in elevators. So I think it's time to be active, kids, and uh, take the damn stairs. Dead family member in your dreams takes us into number five. All right, guys, so if you ever see a dead family member in your dreams, make sure you never, ever get close to them or else something terrible might happen. This is an urban legend over in Korea that goes something like this. So a man kept having reoccurring dreams about his grandmother standing waist deep in a lake and she kept calling him over to her. The man woke up and told his wife that his dead grandmother keeps appearing in his dreams and she wants him to come closer to her. His wife warned him that you should never ever touch a dead family member in your dreams, especially if you're in water because it's actually an evil spirit trying to steal your soul. So the next night he had the same dream, but he kept getting closer and closer to his grandmother until he suddenly just woke up. The more he thought about it, he remembered that he kept an item from his grandmother that she might not wanted him to have. So he visited her grave, returned the item, and then the dream stopped. Luckily for him, because he was very close to having his soul stolen by a demon, because he was getting too close. The girl who wants the bathroom creeps onto this list at number four. In Korea, there are a lot of scary tales about high schools that they're haunted by angry demons or creepy ghosts. Apparently, lots of weird and scary things happen in the bathrooms. 
because there are a ton of Korean urban legends that take place in school washrooms. But this urban legend is about a girl who haunts the last stall in the washroom. People have said that the toilets flush on their own, the door slams shut, and if you go in there by yourself, you can actually hear her cry. But if you are someone who the haunted ghost doesn't like, then she will take it upon herself to brutally murder you. But she does it in a way that it looks like a suicide and no one will ever find out that the last stall is truly haunted. The right eye blinks into number three. The scary urban legend is about a young woman who is blind in one eye. She was eligible to get a cornea transplant in hopes that she would restore her vision completely. The operation was successful and the girl was discharged from the hospital. Exactly one week later, the girl stopped going into work and she wouldn't answer her phone, so her mother got extremely worried. Her parents decided to go back to her house to make sure that everything was alright. When she got there, they found her daughter lying on the floor in a pool of her own blood. She had committed suicide and no one knew why she would want to do this. When the police came to investigate, they noticed that all of the mirrors in the house were smashed and all of the reflective surfaces was covered with a sheet. Inside of her diary, they found a page that said, my right eye is staring at me, my right eye is staring at me. So as the legend goes, her right eye used to belong to a deranged person and his spirit lived on in this eye. Taxi drivers are organ thieves and this slices its way into number two on our list. There was a viral story that originated in Korea about taxi drivers harvesting their customers organs. Yeah, that's right. The scary urban legend is about taxi drivers in Korea sedating their passengers so that they can slice them up, remove their kidney and other organs so that they can sell them on the black market. I guess they don't pay taxi drivers well enough because why else would they come up with something like this? This legend and claims that the taxi driver would take them to an underground surgical room, they would use a dull scalpel and no anesthesia to help with the pain. After the taxi drivers would remove all of their vital organs, the bodies were dumped in a deserted field or on the side of the road where animals would eat the remaining flesh. I mean, is this real life right now? The cuckoo stabs his way into our number one spot. School children begin to spread an urban legend about a mentally insane man who can be found lurking in the dark alleys and side streets waiting for victims to kill. There is a version of this story about a group of young girls walking home from school and as they were walking down a side street they heard cuckoo, cuckoo. When they went to turn around to see what the noise was, the crazy man viciously and aggressively attacked them with an axe. There was another story about a group of 20 Korean girls who were walking down a street when the man stepped out of the shadows and began to bludgeon them with a mallet, but before the police arrived, the man vanished. The cuckoo man was committed to an insane asylum, and while he was there, a female patient nearly killed him, so since then, he developed an intense hatred towards women. So afterwards he escaped the mental institution, he's been trying to get his revenge on women ever since. Number 10, Juche. To set a baseline for this, we're gonna start with the only ideology recognized by the modern state of North Korea. Beyond this, Juche straddles the line between religion and political ideology. With the supreme leaders raised up as supernatural beings, while still proclaiming that the entirety of North Korea is one big equal family. Number 9. Elections. It's interesting to find the distinction between propaganda and legends in North Korea, but when the state controls everything from actions to religion, every single act a citizen takes could be seen as an act of worship. So with the North Korean elections, this is made bluntly clear. If you're at all confused with the idea of North Korea holding elections, it's because they really don't. Remember, this is a country that's playing at being a democracy, so elections have a 100% turnout as a result of this. Anyone who doesn't show up for the election is investigated by the neighborhood watch, and recent elections have even seen that if people try to vote against the official candidate, they can lose their jobs or houses. Not that they could vote against them because there's only ever one candidate. Yeah. Number 8. The rules for taking a picture of the leaders. As North Korea is open to tourists from the public, the government has had to find a way to balance presenting itself in a positive and non-totalitarian light, while also maintaining its cultural independence. 
As a result of this, tourists are often informed before their entry into the DPRK about a very specific rule when it comes to pictures. If they take any pictures of the leaders, or even any statues of the leaders, it must contain the full body of the leader from head to toe. If that picture is printed, it cannot be folded, bent, or creased in any way. In particular, if a tourist decides to take a picture of the Mansu Day Grand Monuments, which features both Kim Il sung and Kim Jong Il, it must include the entirety of the monument and cannot be of one leader alone. Number seven. Empty cities. Not so much a legend, just a general truth. Kijong Dong is a village that was constructed alongside the DMZ with South Korea. It is also, bluntly, completely uninhabited. While the North Korean government denies this, South Korean observers claim that Kijong Dong is entirely devoid of life, outside of the couple of soldiers who take residence there while working at the DMZ. The eeriest detail of this village is its second purpose, as massive loudspeakers were constructed to face the south. These loudspeakers would then blast North Korean propaganda to the south, which encourages soldiers to leave their posts and come join the North Korean forces as allies. The south then responded by setting up their own speakers, which blast counter-propaganda. This screaming match has been going on for a little over half a century, and despite having been briefly stopped as a sign of goodwill in 2004, the 2016 nuclear tests saw both sides resume this little game. Number 6. Kim Jong-il's Tomb When North Korea's great leader Kim Il-sung suddenly died in 1994, the country was in a state of staged national mourning that had never been seen before on such a scale. Then when his successor, the great leader's son Kim Jong-il, the dear leader, suddenly died as well at the end of 2011, the scenes of public mourning even topped those in 1994. Now they lay to rest in the same building, but with everything in North Korea, you just can't go there and visit. One tourist got the chance and said, you're at the mercy of your tour guides and what they've been told they can show you. When we went, Kim Jong Il was laying in state in his glass coffin. Somber music piped through hidden loudspeakers, not a word was spoken. Guards made sure the procedures were orderly and appropriate. We had to line up in fours and bow three times at the great leader's feet and both sides but not the head, as this is regarded as disrespectful apparently. You also can't take photographs. Now, that description just sounds overall spooky, and I don't think I'd want to go there even if I could. Number 5. Hwasong Camp The 212 square mile prison camp is believed to house 10,000 people, many of them political prisoners. Reportedly, no one has ever escaped. Prisoners are exploited for hard, dangerous, and deadly labor in mining, logging, and agriculture. According to Mr. Lee, a former security officer in Hwasong Camp, the inmates were overworked and they had very little time to rest. Prisoners had to work all day until they fulfilled their quotas and attend self-criticism meetings afterward. Often they were allowed to sleep only for four hours at night. Mr. Lee witnessed many fatal accidents in the workplace, and information is extremely limited as the camp has always been a maximum security camp under strict control and surveillance. An unidentified teenager reported how he was sent to the camp with his entire family at age 13. He witnessed his father being beaten cruelly and his mother and sisters being taken advantage advantage of by security guards. Residents from nearby villages have heard about the horrific conditions inside the camp, but were never allowed to get near the camp. Number 4. Ki Jong Dong Ki Jong Dong, better known as Propaganda Village, is a truly creepy place in North Korea. Built in the 1950s, Ki Jong Dong is situated on North Korea's end of the DMZ and has a grand total of 200 people living in it. Well, that's if you believe the North Korean government. In reality, there are absolutely no residents. Zero. It's completely empty. The village was designed to show off the virtues of North Korean lifestyle to South Korean villages in view and to lead to defection. The brightly painted concrete buildings were much more lavish than rural villagers in either country could afford. Each building is wired for electricity with lights running on a timer. Skeleton crews appear at night to maintain the buildings and give the general appearance that someone might actually be living there. However, anyone with a set of binoculars can see that the buildings are empty, some completely lacking floors, ceilings, and even glass windows. Whether or not the village has led to defection is unknown, but it's hard to imagine anyone falling for the trick nearly 60 years later. Number 3. Kim Il-sung Stadium 
Kim Il-sung Stadium is a multi-purpose stadium located in Pyongyang, the capital city of North Korea. It's the largest stadium in the world and can house 150,000 people. Now, I know what you're thinking. How can a stadium be scary? Well, what it's used for is truly haunting. Rarely, if ever, are there any sports events held there as the stadium is mostly used for propaganda and military parades. During these parades, there are many huge images shown in the stands, but it's actually just North Koreans holding up a piece of cardboard to create the image. They have to stand there holding up the cardboard for hours. It's also been alleged that traitors of the state have been taken into the stadium to be paraded around and have never been seen again. In particular, a group of generals disappeared in the stadium after an attempted coup attempt. And later on that day, smoke could be seen coming out of the stadium. Number 2. Room 39 Room 39 is an organization meant to get foreign currency for the leader through any means necessary. It was established by the nation's forefather, Kim Il-sung, in the late 1970s. The agents there would manufacture drugs, counterfeit notes, deal arms, and traffic humans to fund their leader's lavish lifestyle. They hired chemists to produce drugs which are then smuggled to Japan, China, and across Asia. The mysterious organization is estimated to bring Kim Jong-un between, between $500 million and $1 billion per year, enabling him to buy political support and fund nuclear programs. With the revenue from Room 39, Kim never goes hungry. While his people starve to death, Kim enjoys dishes like foie gras, lobster, and caviar. Overall, this is just insane to me how they can get away with this. And coming in at number 1 is Camp 22. Camp 22 was a prison camp in North Korea that was reported to have been closed in 2012, but I'm not too sure I believe that. The camp was a maximum security area, completely isolated from the outside world. The camp was founded around 1965 and is surrounded by an inner 3,300 volt electric fence and an outer barbed wire fence with traps and hidden nails between the two fences. The camp was controlled by roughly 1,000 guards and 500 to 600 administrative agents. The guards were equipped with many weapons to make sure that the prisoners behaved. In the 1990s, there was an estimated 50,000 prisoners in the camp. Prisoners were mostly people who criticized the government, people deemed politically unreliable, or purged senior party members. Based on the guilt by association principle, they are often imprisoned together with their whole family, including children and the elderly, and including any children born in the camp. All prisoners were detained until they died, they were never released. A former guard described the conditions in the camp as harsh and life-threatening. He likened the prisoners to walking skeletons, dwarfs, and cripples in rags. He estimated that about 30% of the prisoners had deformities, such as torn off ears, smashed eyes, crooked noses, and faces covered with cuts and scars resulting from beatings and other mistreatment. Around 2,000 prisoners he said had missing limbs, but even prisoners who needed crutches to walk were still forced to work. Prisoners had to do hard physical labor in agriculture, mining, and inside factories from 5 a.m. to 8 p.m., followed by ideological re-education and self-criticism sessions. Almost 30,000 people reportedly died of starvation at this camp in 2012. This is literally so disgusting, and it makes me so upset that humans could treat other people that way. Ugh. Number 10, Ru Young Hotel. Often regarded as the ugliest building in the world, which I can agree with, the Ru Young Hotel is a 180 story structure in Pyongyang. The hotel was started in 1987 and stopped in 1993, and it seems unlikely that it will ever be finished as a functioning hotel. The building consists of 3,000 suites and five revolving restaurants, at least as it was planned. Currently, it sits at the heart of the city as a con concrete shell, but its massive size, aka 1,082 feet, makes it difficult to ignore as it dominates the skyline. But if you ask anyone who lives in the city, they deny it exists, even though it's clearly there. Tourists traveling by taxi have found it impossible to use the hotel as a landmark because no one admits that the building is there. It's even airbrushed out of official photographs. And even if it ever is finished, who is supposed to stay there? Even ignoring the low wages of the average North Korean, there's no real tourism industry to speak of, so it's just strange. Number 9. The Arch of Reunification The Arch of Reunification was erected in 2001 to commemorate Kim Il-sung 
Pyongyang's proposal of a reunited Korea. The arch stands above the reunification highway, which leads from Pyongyang to the demilitarized zone DMZ. The concrete arc features two Korean women dressed in traditional outfits, holding up a sphere with a map of unified Korea on it. It's one of the more thoughtful gestures from the dictatorship, so thoughtful in fact that it almost makes you forget about those tunnels they dug leading into South Korea. Almost. Anyway, the arch is strange for two reasons. One, the highway it stands above is largely unused. Tourists in the capital city often remark how the highway has large lanes but little traffic. The use of so few cars is attributed to the poor financial standing of the average citizen, so bikes are a more common form of transportation. But the streets are so empty that tour guides will cut across lanes on either side to avoid the numerous potholes. There are also people that believe that the arches have a dual purpose. According to some, the arch was constructed with explosives inside, and I honestly wouldn't put it past them doing this. Number 8. Web Cafes North Korea doesn't really have internet access. Their websites, almost all of them government controlled, are as secluded as the country itself, and for many, the only means of accessing them are through web cafes. North Korea is unable to host their own web pages, and as a result, they rely instead on China, Japan, Germany, and even the United States for servers. As of 2007, Quang Mai Young only permitted access to a little over 30 different pages. They don't offer any connections to the outside world, and instead requests can be made for content. If accepted, Quang Meng Yong downloads, censors, and re-uploads the content. However, Quang Meng Yong remains unattainable for most people. 90% of North Koreans are completely unfamiliar with the internet. While it's theoretically possible to pick up a satellite connection from other Asians' ISPs, smuggling the needed components into the country is next to impossible. For tourists, hotels in the city offer email services, however users aren't permitted to type their messages directly. Instead, they must be written and handed to an employee, and many tourists have noted that their messages are never received and probably are never sent, which is, wow. What a shocker. Number 7. Yongbyon Nuclear Facility One of North Korea's most controversial sites is the Yongbyon Nuclear Scientific Research Center. Yongbyon is North Korea's main nuclear facility. It houses the country's first nuclear reactors and produced the fuel used in the country's nuclear tests in 2006 and 2009. The center produced the fissile material for North Korea's six nuclear weapon tests from 2006 to 2017, and since 2009 is developing indigenous light water reactor nuclear power station technology. As of January 2019, the main facilities did not appear to be operating. However, in August 2021, the International Atomic Energy Agency reported North Korea appeared to have restarted the 5MW reactor, so that's fun. Coming in at number 6 now, owning a car. It's incredibly difficult to own a car in North Korea. Essentially, only state officials are allowed to own a car. In fact, it's estimated that just 1 in 100 people own a car. If you're pulled over in North Korea, then you are breaking the law. I can safely say that because I'm presuming that none of you guys are North Korean state officials. At least I hope so anyway. Moving on to number 5 now, we have no TV channels. There are just 3, and only 3 TV channels in the whole of North Korea. They are all state run, meaning everything is government owned and approved. It is 100% illegal to set up your own TV channel, no matter what it's going to be about. The government knows that knowledge is power, and if they can control what knowledge the people have access to, they can control the people. And number 4 now, you need permission to live in the capital. Pyongyang is the capital city of North Korea and the crown jewel in the regime. It's where all the elite live. Now because of this, you actually need express permission to live there. In most countries, you can live in your capital city as long as there's houses and you have the money to afford it, but if you're found living in Pyongyang without the proper documentation, you may end up living in prison. Next up at number 3, the Bible is illegal. The Bible is the holy book for Christianity, one of the major religions in the West. North Korea sees it as a symbol of the West, and so it is banned. It's that simple. There are only two gods in North Korea, the government and the Kim family who runs it all. Either that or they just don't want spoilers. 
before the Bible movie comes out. All right, and number two now, government approved songs. If any of you guys watching this want to be a successful musician one day, just be glad you're not North Korean. Music is only allowed to be certain genres approved by the government, such as some pop, classical, and Korean folk, and the lyrics must always put the government in a good light. So, you might think you have the greatest song of a generation. Well, just make sure that the government we've been talking about in this video agrees with you, and I'm sure you'll be on the radio in no time. Probably just North Korean radio. And finally, at number one, you can't wear blue jeans. Most of us have probably worn some sort of blue denim jeans on our legs in our lifetime. It's got to be one of the most common clothing types in the West. And that's exactly why it is 100% banned in North Korea. The news broke in 2016 that Kim Jong Un had launched a nationwide crackdown on Western clothing, with jeans being one of the main focuses. Jeans have always been pretty cool, but now that we know they're illegal in North Korea, then they got a little bit cooler. No Kum Sok. No Kum Sok, also known as Kenneth Rowe, was a North Korean pilot who defected to South Korea in 19. 53. No was one of the few North Korean pilots who had been trained to fly the Soviet made MiG 15, a high performance fighter jet. He was stationed at a North Korean airbase near the Yalu River when he decided to get out of there. On September 21st, 1953, No flew his MiG 15 across the border into South Korea and landed at Kimpo Air Base. He was immediately taken into custody by US military officials who were stunned and quite impressed impressed by his audacity. No went on to become a US citizen and worked as an aeronautical engineer for many years. He also wrote a memoir, A MiG-15 to Freedom, which detailed his experiences in North Korea and his daring escape. No story remains one of the most remarkable tales of defection and espionage during the Cold War. Next up we have Kim Shin Jo, born in 1942. Kim Shin Jo was a North Korean commando who in 19 1968, along with 30 other comrades, were sent by the founder of North Korea himself, Kim Il Sung, across the border to assassinate the then president of South Korea, Park Chung Hee. Uh, they had trained for a couple years in order to accomplish this mission and had managed to come pretty close to their target. The Blue House, where the president resided, was in sight, but after being stopped by a police officer who thought their overstuffed trench coats looked a little suspicious, the team soon engaged in a firefight with the Capitol Garrison Command protecting the presidential residence. 29 of the 31 man group lost their lives with one survivor managing to escape back to North Korea and the other, Kim, being arrested by South Korean authorities. For an entire year he was interrogated but ended up being released and became a full fledged South Korean citizen. He, he became a pastor and he's now 80 years old. He's got a wife and two children. King Chul Hwan. King Chul Hwan was a prominent North Korean defector who escaped the country in 1992. Born in Pyongyang in 1968, King's family was part of the country's elite class. However, King's privileged upbringing came to an abrupt end when his grandfather was accused of treason and sent to a labor camp. In 1977, when King was just nine years old, he and his family were forcibly relocated to the Yodok concentration camp, where they spent the next 10 years. The conditions at the camp were brutal, with forced labor, starvation, and even daily beatings. Despite the hardship, Kang managed to survive, and after his release, purchased an illegal radio receiver and began listening to broadcasts from over the border. And then he began to become kind of more and more interested and involved in anti-government activity. But he feared being sent back to Yodog. They, they were kind of starting to suspect him, so he set out to escape. Kang escaped North Korea in 1992, settling in South Korea, where he began to speak out about his experiences. He wrote a book, The Aquariums of Pyongyang, detailing his time in the concentration camp. Kang has since become a vocal advocate for human rights in North Korea and has testified before the United Nations and other international organizations. Wang Jen Yop is renowned as the highest ranking. North Korean politician to have defected. Born in 1923, he rose to be a pivotal politician.
action before escaping from his home country in 1997. Wang is known for having helped establish the North Korean political ideology of Juche, a kind of reworking of Marxist Leninism to put it very simply. Over time though, Wang became disillusioned with the regime's policies and its oppressive tactics. He began to kind of start questioning the ideology of Juche and the cult of personality that surrounded the North Korean leadership. In the mid 1990s, Wang secretly began to plan his defection. In 1997, Wang was visiting Beijing on official business when he decided to make his move. He slipped away from his security detail and walked into the South Korean embassy, posing as a South Korean diplomat using a fake ID. When the truth of his defection was discovered, it caused shockwaves around the world. Wang's defection was a significant blow to the North Korean regime, which had considered him a loyalist. It was also a turning point in South Korea's relations with the North, as it highlighted the, you know, the deep ideological division between the two countries. Wang continued to speak out against the North Korean regime until his death in 2010, and his defection remains one of the most high-profile cases in modern history. Number 6. The North Korean Ghost Ships this is one of the more spooky entries on this list, and it's a major problem in general. As the Chinese government has begun overfishing in North Korean waters, fishermen from North Korea have had to sail out further into the ocean to find a catch. As their ships are usually old and semi-defunct, it's quite common for the crew to end up stuck on the open ocean with no way to return and no GPS. Most of the time, these crews starve to death and end up washing up on Japanese shores. How often does this happen? Well, from the period of about 2011 to 2019, a total of 656 boats have washed up on Japanese shores, many of the boats containing bodies. And the primary cause of death is generally attributed to starvation. Number 5. Kim Jong-il's Mythology So now that we've established Juche, I think it's a good time to showcase exactly what the people of the DPRK are told about their supreme leaders. Now keep in mind that I'm not trying to make it look as if North Koreans are gullible, it's more that I think that the state-mandated stories about Kim Jong-il and his fellow leaders are hilarious. Supposedly, Kim Jong-il's birth was was signified by a new star appearing in the sky, as well as a double rainbow. And his birth was apparently celebrated by everyone in the world. By the age of three, he learned how to walk. And by three, I mean three weeks. By the age of eight weeks, he was also able to speak. He has also written 1,500 books in three years, as well as six full operas, which are apparently, this is a real quote, better than any in the history of music. He's also said to be a proficient golfer, in his first match alone scoring 11 holes in one. This has been verified by his 17 bodyguards. However, he's never played again, and similar to that, his greatest achievement was that, according to an official government website, which has since been taken down, he has never defecated in his life. Number 4. Kim Jong-il's Love of Films However, one of Kim Jong-il's greatest achievements was made in the name of putting North Korea on the map of cinema. However, as he'd created a country that was completely culturally landlocked, Kim Jong-il decided that he'd do this by kidnapping the South Korean film director Shin san ok which he succeeded in doing alongside kidnapping Shin's wife in the process. After nearly a decade in captivity, they'd eventually escape after having completed four films for Kim Jong-il. This actually happened. Number 3. Kirin Gul In 2012, it was made public that North Korean archaeologists had dug up the lair of a Kirin, which is a beast that is frequently referred to as a Chinese unicorn. The government immediately tried to swing this in a direction that claimed that it proved Pyongyang's locational correlation to the ancient kingdom of Goguryeo, as its king was known to ride a Kirin. This was questioned by just about everyone, as the reports then tried to make it seem as if Kim Jong Jong-un was related to the king, but regardless, it seems to have mostly worked as a piece of propaganda within the DPRK. They have also been trying to use it to make the claim that they ought to rule all of Korea because of this discovery, and have used it in actual territorial disputes with China and Japan. 
Number two, Kim Il Sung and snakes. If you're tired of hearing about the rulers of North Korea, you need to understand that there are literally no other myths in that country. With that in mind, there is a secret legend whispered in North Korea of a book that was banned by the state. Apparently, the book contains a prophecy regarding Kim Il Sung, with a message from his father telling him to beware of snakes blocking his path and to avoid traveling on any roads with snakes. This is followed by a another more openly talked about tale regarding Kim and a snake on a mountain. Apparently, one day while Kim Il-sung was walking on a mountain, a serpent blocked his path. He decided to tell the snake to leave, and it just did, allowing Kim to continue down his path. He would then die that same year. Number 1. Kim Il-sung Despite dying to a snake, Kim Il-sung is regarded as a borderline deity within the DPRK. Referred to as the eternal president posthumously, Kim Il-sung is a perfect modern example of someone who has fully transitioned into becoming a martyr. According to defectors, children are taught from birth that every single aspect of their lives exists entirely due to what Kim Il-sung did for them. Pictures of him, Kim Jong-il, and Kim Jong-un are present in every single room of every single building. In the eyes of the average North Korean citizen, Kim Il-sung isn't just a revolutionary who rose to power, he's a god. At number 10, of course, let's start off with the health of Kim Jong-un. That is the big question right now. Is Kim Jong-un alive or is he dead? No one really knows because it has been more than two weeks since anyone has seen any sign of this guy. It all started when he didn't show up to North Korea's biggest holiday, Family Day. I'm just kidding, it's not called Family Day. It would be so funny if their biggest holiday was actually called Family Day. They're a country that tells people what haircut they're allowed to get. But the actual holiday is Army Day, and it is massive in North Korea. It honors the founder of North Korea, Kim Il-sung, who is Kim Jong-un's grandfather, so you can tell it would be very important for him to be there. After all of that happened, word leaked out that a team of Chinese doctors flew into North Korea and were preparing for Kim Jong-un's heart surgery. It took a long time for anyone at a national level to confirm this, but eventually word came out that Kim Jong-un was alive and well. This statement was backed up by the South Korean government who said he was recovering in the resort town of Wonsung. And even though everyone is saying that he's fine, no one has seen his face. The whereabouts and his health of this man are the biggest secret in the country right now. And if he is in fact dead, we might not know about this for a very long time. At number 9 we have their nuclear capabilities. It is known that North Korea is a nuclear country and that they have been doing nuclear tests throughout most of the 2000s and the 2010s. Even though they've been sanctioned many times to stop. Yeah, I don't think they're a country that respects any word from the UN. Now, how many nukes does this country have? Well, this is a mystery for any country that has been building up these weapons of mass destruction. For North Korea, however, it seems that they have been boasting a number much higher than Intel would believe that they actually have. The North Korean military claims that they have nuclear capabilities to take on every world superpower and most countries. That they have the most advanced missile launching systems in the world, but in reality, they probably have somewhere between 30 to 50 nukes, which is still a lot, but with the anti-missile systems within America and the ability to shoot down nukes before they even launch, North Korea probably won't be able to take on the whole world. I mean, if you want to do something like that, you gotta at least have like two nukes per country or something. At number eight, we have the coronavirus numbers. How many people in North Korea have coronavirus? Well, if you ask them, they will say zero. And then you go, wait, your main trading partner is China, the place where the outbreak happened, and you say the number is still zero zero and then you go hey wait everyone in your country is wearing masks why would they be wearing masks is it just a fashion choice and the number is still zero it's unknown why North Korea is not telling anyone what the numbers of the virus are in their country this could be because they want to seem strong in the face of a global pandemic it makes it seem like their people are immune to the virus or it could be simply because they don't want to leak any sort of medical information from their country to the world or they're simply not testing and they have no idea and they aren't acknowledging that the virus virus is a real thing. Either way, they are claiming that the number is still zero, which is really hard to believe because it's even in Iceland. If it gets in Iceland, it gets in everything.
everywhere. At number seven, we have North Korea's GDP. A country's GDP or gross domestic profit is extremely important. It's basically the value of goods that come in and out of the country and how much wealth your country is generating and the value of your dollar. Now the GDP of North Korea has never been disclosed. They would have us believe that they're one of the richest, most powerful countries in the world, that we should marvel at what they're able to do and that they are an economic powerhouse. But the truth is that we have no idea what their GDP is, but experts would say it's not good. Not only is North Korea extremely corrupt, probably taking large chunks of profit from every major company that is operating in the country, but most nations won't engage in any sort of trade with them, which means except for China, no one is willing to buy anything from them, which plummets your GDP. On top of that, many experts suspect that their GDP is one of the lowest in the world. The exact figures are unknown, but it's thought that their GDP is somewhere around $500 per person. Now, just to hold a mirror up to this, America's is $50,000 per person. So you can only imagine what it's like living in North Korea. Next on the list is Jang Yongjin, born in 1957 or 58. We're not too quite sure on that. Jang defected from North Korea in 1997. Jang was born and raised on the eastern coast of North Korea in the city of Chongjin. In 1976, he joined the North Korean military, but was discharged in 1982 after contracting tuberculosis. He then began working as a wireless communications official in his hometown. He would marry a woman through an arranged marriage, but their relationship never seemed to work out as Jang didn't have much of an attraction to her, or any woman for that matter. Jang was on able to discuss his feelings both with his wife or anyone for that matter because as Jang would state himself there's no concept of homosexuality in North Korea if someone is seen running to greet another same-sex friend it's assumed that's just because they have such a close friendship. Jang's family simply assumed there was something medically wrong with him. In 1997, he would be one of the few North Korean citizens to successfully flee to South Korea by crawling through the demilitarized zone. Today, Jang is happily married, working as an author. Lee Hyun Seo, probably messing up that name there. Again, sorry. Born and raised in Hisan, a city near the border with China, Lee grew up in a society where the government controlled every aspect of daily life. A life that Lee believed to be completely normal as a child. He was taught to be fiercely loyal to the regime, just like all children were, and to see the outside world as an enemy. Lee would escape from North Korea in 1997, where she lived alone for 10 years as an illegal immigrant. Due to suspicions from Chinese authorities, however, she soon fled to South Korea in 2008. After discovering that the money she had sent to her family had been intercepted by North Korean police, she became worried worried about their safety and decided to go back for them. She managed to guide them over the border, embarking on a dangerous journey through China where they would nearly be caught on several occasions. Lee published a memoir about her experience called The Girl with the Seven Names and has become an advocate for human rights and speaks frequently about her life in North Korea, hoping to raise awareness about the plight of those who still remain trapped in the country. Kim Sho Wung, this North Korean born pianist, defected from his home country in 2001. Kim started playing the piano at a young age and quickly demonstrated a natural talent for the instrument. In 1996, he was accepted into the Pyongyang Music and Dance University, one of the most prestigious music schools in North Korea. After graduation, Kim began his professional career as a pianist, performing at various concerts and events in North Korea. He soon gained popularity for his exceptional skill and interpretation of classical music. However, in 2001, Kim decided to defect from North Korea. He had become disillusioned with the repressive regime in North Korea and wanted to pursue his passion for music in a more free society. He left his home country with 2,000 American dollars in his pocket, which he ended up having to bribe undercover authorities with, who eventually helped him cross the Tumen River into China. Once in China, he joined a church where he played piano before discovering that South Korea would provide asylum to those defecting from North Korea. While trying to leave the Beijing airport, however, he was arrested and sent back on a train to North Korea. But he escaped 
out the window. He was once again caught in China though and sent back to a prison camp in North Korea for a second time. Miraculously though, the investigator in charge of Kim knew his father and respected his father greatly actually because he had received his current position thanks to his father. So the investigator did Kim a solid and managed to have him released. Kim headed back straight to the Tumen River where he was able to escape without a hitch this time, eventually receiving asylum in South Korea in 2002. Zhang Quang Il. Now, I was actually kind of hesitant about putting this guy on the list at first because I feel like it's almost counterproductive to bring too much attention to what he does as his work would be more effective without too many people knowing about him. But uh, there's there's articles about him already. He's been on the news. He's done um, interviews. Plus, I just find him so interesting. I couldn't help it. Zhang Quang Il is a North Korean defector who smuggles all kinds of entertainment from South Korea and the US in to North Korea. I'm not even going to talk about his methods of doing this because again, I just, I don't feel right about putting it all out there in the open, even though the information is very easy to find. But uh, he sent all kinds of media over, movies like Skyfall, South Korean soap operas, and even testimonials from other North Korean defectors, all in hopes that feeding information from the outside world into a country with no free press, no internet, very little, if any, contact uh, with the outside world would open the eyes of the North Korean people to the tyranny that they're under. Yeonmi Park. Yeonmi Park fled from North Korea with her mother in 2007. After her father was caught smuggling and sent to a labor camp, her family became desperate for food. Park managed to obtain an illegally imported VHS tape of Titanic, which opened her eyes to the world outside of North Korea and changed her view of the country. And after her father was eventually reunited with the family, they made the decision to escape to China. However, her father ended up staying behind due to illness. Yeonmi's journey with her mother was treacherous, but they eventually made their way to South Korea when they were granted asylum. Yeonmi uh, has since become a vocal advocate for human rights and has spoken extensively about her experiences in North Korea. Her memoir, In Order to Live, A North Korean Girl's Journey to Freedom, has become an international seller. She's probably best known for being featured on the Joe Rogan podcast where she talked about her ordeal. So if you want to hear more about her, you know how long Joe Rogan podcast are, definitely check it out. And lastly, we have Oh Chong Sung, the most recent prominent North Korean defector. Oh was an industrial engineer in North Korea who made his escape. He drove his car right up to the North and South Korean border, crashing his vehicle before exiting it and scrambling towards the South Korean side. North Korean guards began firing at him and he took several gunshots before finally collapsing to the ground. But he'd made it. He was retrieved by South Korean soldiers and transported to the Aju University Hospital. Oh had been struck five times and had lost half of his blood. The doctors also discovered large parasitic worms in his digestive tract. But despite his life-threatening injuries, the doctors managed to save his life and said it was a miracle he had survived. This entire incident that took place in the demilitarized zone was captured on camera and it's pretty intense. Oh has spoken out about his experience, quoted as saying, I was extremely terrified. I watched this video once in a while and every time I see it, I realize the fact that I'm alive is a miracle. Even I can't believe something like this happened. I can't believe it's me in the video. So starting off this list, and at number 10, we have the eyeless woman. There is a certain highway in Korea that is known to be always foggy and have poor visibility. Over the years, there has been a lot of car accidents that occur on this very highway. But it wasn't due to poor visibility. According to the locals, they believe that the fog isn't the reason for killing people on this highway. Instead, they believe that something supernatural is at play here. Some drivers have claimed that they saw a young woman wearing sunglasses and roaming the highway at night. First of all, why is she wearing sunglasses at nighttime? I would be um, questioning her sanity. Once the driver gets close to her, they discover that this woman isn't wearing sunglasses. Her eyes are actually gouged out and she roams the highways waiting for drivers to crash so she can claim her victim. I mean, what the heck is going on? Cockroach Facial comes crawling onto this list at number nine. This is a scary story about a man who was so ashamed of his acne that 
he decided to try an untested and very unconventional way of treating his acne. He once read about an article online that said, if you place a live cockroach onto your pillow at night, it will cure your acne. I'm pretty sure he found like a trolling website. Well, he was so desperate, he decided um, to give it a shot. He's like, what the heck, let's do it. I think I would rather have acne than have a house full of cockroaches because don't they multiply very, very quickly? I mean, once you let one in, it's game over. So anyways, getting back to this man, the man caught a gross looking cockroach outside of his apartment and placed it onto his pillow. I would like wash the cockroach first. I honestly don't even know how he managed to fall asleep. When he woke up, the cockroach was gone, so he ran to the mirror to see what his results were and his acne, it actually, it did clear up. So he got dressed and headed to school. But the story doesn't end there. Of course it doesn't. The next morning he felt pain and was extremely like itchy all over his face. So he took a closer look at his skin and saw that his pores had been filled with cockroach eggs. I really hope that this is only an urban legend because that would make me want to rip off my face. Like what do you do? <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> Red ink drips into number eight on this list. A lot of Korean households have banned red pens because if you use them it generally means that you will encounter some sort of bad luck. Koreans believe that red is associated with death, evil, and pretty much everything else along those lines. Red ink is predominantly used to write the name of a dead person, not the living. So if you use a red pen in Korea, they believe that something evil will happen to you, so you need to be careful. Or if you write someone's name who is alive in red ink, that means you wish them harm or death. So it's just best to avoid using red ink while you're in Korea. I'd stick to either black or blue because I'm pretty sure there aren't any crazy superstitions surrounding those colored inks. Well, hopefully not. Now at number seven, we have the Cho no Guishin. And I'm probably saying it wrong. Well, they're more widely known as a virgin ghost because they were murdered before they were able to get married. So now they haunt this earth looking for males to marry. They can also be found in abandoned buildings, hospitals, schools, bathrooms, cemeteries, and wooded areas. So basically, these scary and horrifying ghosts are everywhere. You know you've seen one because they all have long black hair covering their faces and they're dressed in traditional white clothes of mourning and they just look creepy as hell. You will also feel a sudden drop in temperature, the wind will change directions, and you will feel very uneasy. There's this one story about a man who had a loud knock at his door. When he went to answer it, no one was there, but he heard a voice telling him to close his eyes and count to 100, and try not to make a sound or else he will die. He was superstitious, so he listened to the instructions until he reached the number 49. And then he decided to open Open his eyes out of curiosity, but once he opened them, he saw a scary virgin ghost who was eagerly waiting to murder him. I mean, that is pretty freaking scary if you ask me. At number six, we have labor camps. This is how North Korea is able to enforce their iron rule over their country with fear of being put into labor camps. If you are convicted of a crime in North Korea, there are two options that will come with your sentencing, which will be death, or you'll be sent into a camp where you have to work all day in some of the worst conditions and you will most likely die over there. Flyovers of the country have shown massive plots of land, mostly in the mountains where people are forced to work as slaves to the North Korean government. Each one of these camps is surrounded by massive fences covered in barbed wire that constantly have a high electrical current running through them. The exact number of work camps is unknown, but it's thought that they sit somewhere around 16 and that there's approximately 200,000 people working in these work camps right now. Now, what do you have to do to get thrown in one of these camps? Well, really anything. It could be as simple as petty theft or saying something wrong about the government. At number five, we have childhood. There is no fun growing up in North Korea. The small G GDP that the country is generating mostly comes from those work camps and another portion comes from child labor. Education is so poor that most families can't afford to live, so many people have their children start working as soon as they are old enough. There's also a ton of medical problems that most children in North Korea have. 28% of kids that are born in the country grew up with some sort of deformity or stunted growth because of lack of nutrition. Over a quarter of the children in the country will have their body's natural processes halted because they can't get enough food. 
food. Number four, we have national spending. You think with all the starving children you have in your country, you would at least put a little bit of money into social services to help those people. Well, this is North Korea that we're talking about. Once again, all those exact figures are probably only known by Kim Jong-un himself, well, if he's still alive, but it's estimated that a third of the country's GDP goes directly into military funding. They keep most of the people in their country sick or starving so they can beef up their military so they can create the illusion that they are some sort of global contender. At number three, we have other forms of revenue. When work camps aren't making you enough money and no one in the world will trade with you, how do you keep bringing in money so you can buy some tanks to make people think that your country isn't the worst place on earth? Well, you start committing insurance fraud around the world. The North Korean government has been caught more than once committing massive amounts of insurance fraud. What they do is they will take huge insurance claims out with foreign companies. The contracts for these claims will be under North Korean law. This will usually be for some sort of massive helicopter or building or something like that. Something that's worth a ridiculous amount of money, so the insurance claim will be upwards of $50 million. They will then claim that this thing is destroyed and ask for the insurance money. This was such a nuisance in the mid-2000s that several large American companies sued North Korea, but they were unable to get any sort of monetary compensation. Hmm big surprise. And number two, we have they control the date. Many of us have agreed that the year is 2020. We know that the earth is much older than that, but it's the standard that we have all said is fair so we can help the world run normally. Well, in North Korea, they have their own calendar and it says that it's year 108. How did they get to that arbitrary number? Well, I'll tell you that there's actually a lot of weight behind it. The North Korean calendar starts on April 15th, 1912, which is the day that the founder of North Korea, Kim Il-sung, was born. That's how you know your country has a stranglehold on it. When the dictator changes when time started to coincide with his birth. That is crazy. And for the number one spot, we have the famine cannibals. One of the worst tragedies to ever hit North Korea was the famine that started in 1994 and stretched into 1998. Major damage was done to farming crops from natural disasters and the country had no funds to support its people. Not that it would have if the money was there. This forced people to do whatever they could to try and survive. They turned to anything that could possibly be used as food. Wildlife went first, then it went on to insects. When you could no longer find a good enough bug supply, people started eating leather off their boots and clothes. Dirt and bark was the next step, and then not long after that, it was suspected that people started to kidnap orphan children and carve them up in their homes. They would then sell the meat and consume it themselves. There was a saying from people who were fleeing North Korea at the time, if you don't know where the meat comes from, don't eat it. That's terrifying. All right, everyone, that has been our list. And as promised, I'm going to be doing some more pet shout outs, something to bring up the mood a little bit. Remember, if you want me to shout out your pet, you can hit me up on Instagram. I pick new pets every day. So if you don't get picked one day, you can message back another day. I usually pick who messaged most recently. So just message me as many times as you want. I don't care. And without taking any longer, let's shout out some pets. To kick things off, we have Mac, who's the perfect little hamster boy. Look at him all balled up like that. Right after that, we have Bruce, who is simultaneously a big boy, with a big ol' head and a floofer. I didn't know that world of perfection actually existed. My heart is melting. Then we have a nice close-up of Bella, who's looking great during quarantine. I wish I could snuggle her. Next, we have Tommy, who does have a little bit of a sinister look about him, but I bet he's a great guy. And to close it out, we have Chase, who's enjoying the sunshine so much. Look at that big smile on that boy's face. If you enjoyed these photos that were smuggled out of North Korea, then you have to check out these mysterious photos that were taken from Area 51. The most secretive and secure place on the planet. Click now. What are you waiting for?